This is the Diamond Hogs Podcast with Mason Choate and Robert Stewart. Welcome to the Diamond Hogs Podcast. I'm your host, Mason Choate. You know who I'm joined by. It's Robert Stewart and Christian Cheatham. We are the Diamond Hogs Podcast, part of Hogbeat Podcast Network, hogbeat.com, H-A-W-G-B-E-A-T.com. We're the Arkansas site Part of the Rivals Network covering the Arkansas Razorbacks. Incredible coverage, not just baseball, but basketball and football as well. We've got you covered. And we got a busy show today on the Diamond Hawks podcast. We're going to have Arkansas third baseman Caleb Callie on the show. Callie. We're going to have Caleb Callie on. Excited to talk to him. Go ahead, Robert. I Where's he him. going? Huh? He's Tell going us where he's going. Back, back to Callie Cali. Uh, excited to talk to Caleb Callie. But before we do, um, there's some bad news that I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast knows by now. Cody Frank is done for the year, which is just unfortunate because just a couple episodes ago, we were talking about how he's going to be our guy on the mound. Uh, Didn't even have time to give him a nickname, and he's done for the year. Lat injury. Uh, We talked to Dave Van Horn at the Swatters Club on Monday. Seemed like they were hopeful that it would be five to six weeks if if the results that they were hoping for came back. And it sounds like the results came back worse than they were expecting, and he's done for the year. So that is now two significant contributors uh, on the mound done for Arkansas. Uh, Jackson Wiggins, before the season, torn UCL, done. Cody Frank, now done. Uh, Dave Van Horn said it on a radio show this morning. He was their best bullpen arm. So – Not only did you lose your projected ace, but you lost your best bullpen arm. And you're also without Brady Tiger for five to six weeks. So, uh, Robert, it's it's tough, man. It is. Yeah, I mean, there's really no two ways about it. Um, You know, you never want to see one guy go down for the year, much less two. And, you know, without Brady Tiger for the foreseeable future, like it's going to be a grind for for these guys to to figure out, you know, some sort of lineup coming out of the back end like I I don't even know where you go like it's you know Christian will will attest to this but uh you know it's encouraging to see Dylan Carter come on the way he has over the last week picked up a couple wins thrown like seven and two-thirds innings over three games so you know he's at the very least capable of getting you know six or seven outs at the minimum for you which which is nice but Oh man, some somebody else you heard Hunter Holland say it last week is going to have to step up too. Yeah, Christian. I mean, like, good for you and good for Dylan Carter, right? Like, Dylan Carter has been throwing really well. Dave Van Horn said after Tuesday's win over Army, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, that Dylan Carter had, I mean, like, he looked great. Uh, he said some of his stuff he was throwing was nasty. We talked to Dylan. He said that everything was working for him. So, props to you, Christian, for calling that one. Yeah, I knew it all along. Good job. Proud of you. Uh yeah, so the win over Army. It I'm it, it's it's encouraging that you see this lineup. They're able to, you know, battle back, not, you know, get down in the dumps and they can get the big hits when they need them. You know, you think about the Jared Wagner, uh what, 427 foot homer or something like that, just right to the batter's eye. It was incredible. I mean, the the dude has insane power. Uh, and then Kendall Diggs, just as clutch as it gets. And it, we ask him every time he does this, like, hey, what is it? Like, I, how do you do that? And every time he just gives the answer of, like, you know, I, I don't know. I just hit the ball. So, like, I'm like, okay, well, Kendall, why don't you just do that every time you go to the plate, you know? It seems like he can get the hit when he needs to. So, like, why not do it every time? Valid point. But I did like his quote the other day. You know, he wasn't he wasn't having a good day at the time. He's like, you know what? Never too late to have a good day. Yeah, no, I mean Kendall Diggs, a, a a hitter. That's how you describe Kendall Diggs. He hits he hits baseballs and he's good at that. Uh, but I mean, Arkansas was down for most of this game. They had to tie it up. What the bottom of the sixth? The so Wagner had the three run homer and then Borfin had the solo shot to right that tied it up. Uh, and then Army takes a gets another run in the next inning. So then it's five four, and it takes a a three run shot from Kendall Diggs in the bottom of the eighth to. Put Arkansas ahead. Eventually, you know they won. Dylan Carter ran into a little bit of trouble there, uh, in the in the top of the ninth, and it was it was it was kind of unfortunate that he did because you were hoping that maybe you could see Sean Fitzpatrick, 
Uh, he was warming up in the bullpen. We've been, you know, hoping to see a little bit of him. And uh, Dave Van Horn was like, no, nah, we it, Dylan ran into some trouble. We needed to let him finish that off. And uh, fortunately for Arkansas, he did. They beat Army, a good Army team. Army, these teams that Arkansas is playing are good teams. The, and the thing is, is like they've been playing quality competition, so their records might not look like they're good teams, but they're good teams. Um, and they got another one this weekend in Louisiana Tech coming up, Robert. Yeah, I mean, you've you've heard it pretty much throughout the whole season uh, and, and even before the season started. You know, you can go back to last July before they put a schedule out, you know. The, the this team was not going to get burned by RPI again, right? And and so there's been a noticeable uptick in in the quality of of opponent so far. You know, I I don't know if you guys saw this, but I retweeted Bright State the other day on Tuesday. They won like twenty three to six or something. Like, I mean, these teams are for real. Yeah, no, they are, and it's it's good for Arkansas, especially you know. With the newer, like coming into the season, the big story was like you only had two returning guys in the starting lineup. So it's it's good for them to, you know, be not only be playing, you know, competition to, you know, get everything together, but they are also, um, you know, meshing together against good competition. That's the thing. It's like it's not just competition. It's good competition. And Louisiana Tech, man, coming to town, going to be tough. Uh but I think before we get into Louisiana Tech, I think we need it, and you kind of hit on it a little bit, Robert. The big question that everybody wants to know is, now that you don't have Cody Frank, you're without Brady Tiger for five to six weeks, hopefully. And I think that we've all kind of felt weird about that because it seems like uh, maybe it could be longer. We don't know. Um, but five to six weeks is, is what we've been told. But who else can step up? We talked about Dylan Carter. Who else were we expecting to step up, Robert? I mean, you mentioned him earlier. We're, you know, ever since the fall, we've we've all been big Sean Fitzpatrick guys. Uh, I mean, it seems like, you know, maybe the door hasn't quite opened since since he's a left-hander in particular, and all the pitchers who have been injured are, are right-handers. But, um, you know, I I still I still am am very intrigued by this guy. As far as righties go, um, I mean, you know, Hunter Allen was talking about all the freshmen, right? Uh, Christian Fouch was, was one of the guys who, whose name came up. Uh, I can't remember the others, but Ben Bybee maybe um, has, has, has a shot to, to, you know, contribute, I guess. Uh, I would say Parker Coyle based on his start the other day, you know, we talked about the army game. We didn't really bring him up. He was, he was definitely serviceable. Gave, gave you almost four innings. Um, You know, if not for that home run, that would have been a much more respectable line, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. Christian, any names that you have before I go? Because I have some names because I was prepared. Yeah, just Ledbetter and, and Carter for me. Maybe Gage Wood if he can get back some control. Um, he's had a couple appearances. He's only given up, I think, two runs in the year, but they haven't been very sharp. So, um, yeah, we'll see who steps up. But, yeah, I think it's going to be Adcock, Carter, and Ledbetter as far as from the right side this year. Yeah, Ledbetter, he had a promising outing on Tuesday against Army. Uh, I mean, guys, Zach Morris is going to have to figure it out, right? That's that's a guy that he's he's flying under the radar right now, but if if there's any time for Zach Morris to step up, it's right now. Like, he has to get it figured out. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I totally forgot about him in that discussion, but you know, if he continues to struggle, then, then that's probably Sean Fitzpatrick, his, his in, right. Um, but I, I think, I think Morris is just going to get a bunch of chances just because they know how good he can be. Right. So they're going to, they're going to ride him and ride him until, until they decide, he's not going to be able to replicate what he did last year, which I don't know if they're going to reach that point. You know, I feel, I feel like he'll, he'll figure it out sooner than later. I, but you know, I, I don't know because I I kept thinking that throughout the whole off season and it didn't, it didn't happen. So I don't know. Yeah. That, well, the thing with Morris is like his ERA was just incredible last year and he wasn't striking a lot of guys out. It was just, he was just pitching the contact and getting outs. He was great at that. And I, I think that I, I think it, it's a location thing with him right now because uh, he's still like pitching to contact and he's getting hit hard. And so he's got to figure that out. 
Another guy, just throw it out there, Cooper Dossett, another name that could possibly do something, you know, a freshman right-hander that, you know, has talent, dealt with some injuries. I I, I guess he's healthy now. I think I think he's healthy, so um, maybe you see him a little bit more. They're going to have to figure it out, though. But this weekend you got Louisiana Tech, and it's going to be tough to, uh, you know, get up in a game like that or against a team like Louisiana Tech where you're like, hey, let's get some of these freshman arms in. Because, I mean, let's just – everybody heard – or not everybody, but a lot of people know about what happened with Louisiana Tech, you know, during their midweek thing with Ole Miss. Game got rained out. Uh, or Well, it they had to cancel the game, right? And Louisiana Tech was ahead when they canceled it by a run. But because they canceled it in the middle of an inning, they went back to the previous inning score – where Ole Miss was winning and Ole Miss was declared the winner. Did I describe that correctly? That's that's just about right. And and you know I think the big point of contention was that Ole Miss didn't tarp the field when you know it was raining pretty hard during a lightning delay. And so you know if they were able to tarp the field, then they would have had a playable field to finish the game on. But they they didn't have a, a playable field. So uh, the the previous day. Louisiana Tech did get a win though, six to five. That was the the game that uh, Ethan Bates closed out, correct? Christian, one of his two saves this year. Yeah, yeah, that was the game he closed it out. I caught the end of it. Um, I I was texting you guys. I was like, hey, Ethan Bates is pitching right now versus Ole Miss, and they're winning. And you guys were like, all right, let us know how he does. So he got the save. I think it was like a walk, double play, and then a strikeout to finish off Ole Miss. So I mean, it wasn't anything crazy but it was a save against Ole Miss on the road which is huge so yeah nothing to sneeze at no it's not (laughs) uh if I was Louisiana Tech if I was running their website because I'm I'm looking at their schedule right now they haven't marked down as a loss to Ole Miss I wouldn't even put the L there I would just put like three to four they have like the six innings game ended due to weather I would just put the score just put like did not complete or did not finish or something. No contest is is how I think that game should have been ruled. Yeah, like they have. I guess they have to play by the rules, but also it's like your website. You can do whatever you want. You know, I I don't know. I don't I don't know if there's rules that requires them to put that they lost. I I'm not gonna mark that down as a loss for Louisiana Tech in my book. Uh, and then they swept Northwestern, uh, last weekend. So. This is, I mean, the, we've talked to Damon Horn about, you know, how this the Louisiana Tech series is always tough for Arkansas. Uh, you get them at home, so that's that's a plus. And so this is going to be, this. I mean, this is going to be the toughest series so far, right? I mean, I don't really think it's close. Like, no, no offense to Wright State or Eastern Illinois, but uh, this is going, this is really going to tell us, like, where Arkansas is at, especially as far as the lineup goes. Uh, the pitching, I, I mean, do we give the pitching a pass if they struggle at times outside of, you know, Hagen Smith and Hunter Holland and even Will McIntyre? Like those guys, you need you need those guys to produce. But if, you know, I don't know. Like can you give the, the, the pitching staff a pass? I mean, you know my philosophy about these non-conference games. So maybe if you take if you look at it that way, yes. But at the same time, like, Think about what Dave Van Horn has said about Louisiana Tech this year, right? Like, it it totally feels like scheduling this series the week before conference starts was by design, right? Um, you know, this – this he mentioned that this series was, uh, I guess, uh, payback for for uh, their their trip to, to Ruston a couple years ago. Uh, and if you'll remember, that series was the week before they started the, the conference slate against Alabama. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think both coaches the this is, this is the series that they want right before their league, league play starts. And so I, I think you're going to want, uh, you know, pristine performances from, from everybody to, to, to feel good going into, you know, what's going to be a gauntlet of an SEC schedule this year. I mean, yeah, you do, but they've been dealt an awful hand man like the 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 it's just tough you you lose your projected ace then you lose your best bullpen guy and you've also lost your closer for five to six weeks is what we know uh you mentioned the the louisiana tech series ahead of the alabama series i guess that was 2021 right um 
you just hope that the first game uh, against Auburn doesn't go the way that that first game against Alabama went because that would be awful. Didn't Arkansas well, lose like 16 to 1? Yeah, some horrible like that, but they won the series, so. They won the series. I'm just saying, like, you don't want the first game to go that way. That wouldn't be good. Um. Okay. Before Let's... we get too far from that, there there was a quote. I listened to Lane Burroughs yesterday. Uh, somebody somebody asked about the injuries, and he said, "I expect nothing but a normal Arkansas team." So, you know, the 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 quality of opponent the, they're they're not changing anything based on, you know, the hand that Arkansas got dealt, as as you put it. No, I mean they shouldn't, and nor nor should Arkansas. You know, like pity themselves or whatever, like feel bad for themselves. Right. Nope. And no one else is going to feel bad for them either. Like exactly. No. That it, it reminds me of what Eric Musselman said on uh I, I guess it was Tuesday. He was talking to the media. Or no, that was after the Kentucky game. He said he he said that uh nobody feels bad for them for the injuries that they had, and he sure as heck isn't gonna feel bad for anybody else who has injuries. So um that's not word for word, and that's just along the same line. So it, I think that applies to this situation as well. Uh Okay, Robert, you want to get into the projected starting pitchers because you are the research guy. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so the Sunday the Sunday spot is a bit of a question mark, but it seems more defined than uh, I guess the last two series. So there is that. Uh, we'll we'll just go ahead and start off on Friday. They've got a redshirt senior going. He's a lefty named Jonathan Fincher. He's got a two point eight four ERA, one point WHIP even. Opponents are hitting 225 against them, and he's thrown 19 innings. So, um, you know that's uh, that's in three starts thus far. I think he has an appearance uh, as in in addition to those three starts, but uh, gonna have to hit a southpaw in in the opener. So, I don't know. Let's see. We expect to see Hudson Polk maybe in the first game, just because you know. I guess this is a conversation for later. We'll go ahead and finish the scouting report, but uh, he he is the right-handed bat of you know not that Roland can't hit uh right-handed but I, I know that I know that Dave likes to talk about Roland hitting against right-handed pitchers because he can swing left-handed so uh something to consider there maybe we don't see Kendall Diggs on on Friday I think that would be a foolish decision decision but I I did notice that that he didn't start against the lefty last week um anyway moving on sophomore righty named Raleigh Hector will We'll go on Saturday. He's got a 4.4 ERA. Whips much higher, closer to two. Opponents hitting better than 300 against him. And he's only thrown 14 and a third innings. So uh, the numbers don't really jump out at you. I I would say that Saturday presents a a good opportunity for the Razorbacks to run up the score, especially if uh, Friday doesn't go well against the ace. So... Uh, keep an eye on that one. And then Reed Smith, he's a junior righty, is the expected Sunday guy. Uh, Lane Burroughs was talking about it. I believe, uh, May- Mason, maybe you can check the box score for me right now. But I believe on Sunday he only went a third of an inning. Uh, he was dealing with some finger swelling. I don't know you know, how much that had to do with, uh, with his poor stats that day. But uh, on the year, he's got a 6.75 ERA. Whips are right around 1.3. Opponents hitting better than 250 against them, and he's only thrown nine and a third innings. So, um, not quite sure what to make of this guy. Uh, he's expected to be fine and ready to go for for this Sunday contest against Arkansas, uh, but we shall see. Yeah, the box score for Sunday shows Smith threw a third of an inning, gave up four earned on four hits, and his one out was a strikeout. So. He get he had a strikeout and then the other four batters that he faced he gave up hits and he gave up four runs on those hits so not ideal so yeah we'll see we'll see how much uh, that that finger swelling uh, was was problematic for him um, I guess right now we can go ahead and transition into relievers uh, there were there were two that I wanted to highlight the first of which is senior righty Landon Tompkins rocking a sub one ERA a sub one WHIP Opponents not even hitting 200 against him, and he's logged 12 and two-thirds innings. So um, I would say if any of those starters fail, they can turn to him, and he should be able to eat up some innings for them very effectively. And then the other guy, 
you know, we got to mention Ethan Bates. We talked about him a little bit earlier. He's got a couple saves on the year, has not given up an earned run. Uh, he's got a .67 whip. Opponents hitting 105 against him in six innings. So, um, you know, hopefully it doesn't get to get to a situation for Arkansas where they got to face the closer because it's Ethan Bates right now, and Ethan Bates has got it going right now. Yeah, no, Ethan Bates, definitely a, a, a good story. Like, you're you're happy for the guy that he's having success after leaving Arkansas. Went the JUCO route, now he's at Law Tech, and – Doing great. He's also say so he's he's the reliever, but he's also hitting over three hundred, right? I mean, he's he's he, he's a two way player and he's really good. It's one of those situations where, you know, it's good for him. You're happy for the guy, and it, he's probably more suited to the level that he's playing on. But you look at it and you're like, man, that's one of those guys that you didn't want to let get away. And I I think we kind of felt that way, right? When when he left, was like, this is a guy that you probably didn't want that to happen. But it did uh, along the same lines. And I, I just want to throw this out there because it, it came to my head. So, you know, like we know how, how, what the catcher situation is like for Arkansas right now. It's it's unfortunate, not unfortunate, but it hasn't been what it has been in years past, you know, where you have a solid everyday guy that is very reliable. Um, and this is no offense to Hudson Polk and Parker Rowland because I think it's by design that they're going to split time. It's just neither one of them has really, you know, you know, shown that they're the guy, you know. And you look at it, and Arkansas has – there's two catchers that transferred out of Arkansas that have been starters in the SEC and Dylan Leach and Dominic Thomas at Alabama. So it's like, man, that stinks. David Horn did mention Dylan Leach at the Swatters Club on Monday, though. And what we heard is, like, Leach wanted to be an everyday guy and that wasn't going to happen in Arkansas. So he left. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you had to know based on based on the way things went that that, that just wasn't going to be the case. Like, you know, no disrespect to him, but, you know, if, if you want to start, you, you know you got to leave. And, and, you know, so far it's working out for him. Obviously he had that really cool moment in Texas that we all got to see. Um, so, you know, good for him. All right, get into the lineup. Well, let's go. Let's go ahead and start with Ethan Bates, since uh, since we were just talking about him. Like you said, he's hitting over three hundred. He is. Uh, he has an OPS north of a thousand. So uh, that is, you know, as I as I mentioned earlier, nothing nothing to sneeze at. Uh, there are four other hitters I want to talk about that are you know doing anything really worth worth noting. Uh, they've got a a right fielder who can also play first base. He's a senior. His name is Philip Matulia. Hope that's right. Uh, He's only hitting 286. Normally, I like to pick out the guys who uh, are hitting 300 or better, but this guy has an OPS above 1,100. He's got a team leading six home runs and 16 RBIs. So this guy is uh, someone to watch out for from a power perspective. Uh, His OVP is only 340, but he is slugging 761. So um, he's he's not the kind of guy that you necessarily need to – uh, pitch around. I, I think I saw on the on the stat sheet he's only only been walked twice to 14 strikeouts this year. So uh, he's uh, he's one of those you know Caleb Calley type guys where he he could he could lead the team in in OPS and strikeouts. I, I think that that was the the thing that I mentioned um, several weeks ago. Anyway, uh, moving on. Dalton Davis. He's a first baseman. Plays a little second base as well. 319. Uh, average 418 OBP, slugging 489. Noteworthy. Uh, Adarius Myers, the guy plays left field for him, hitting 353, uh, OBP of 477. So uh, that guy can get it done. And then their best hitter and uh, best OPS guy, too. I, I did it by slash lines. I should have just done OPS. Oh, well. But uh, this guy also over 1,100, Walker Birchfield. He's their DH and leads the team in hitting at 360. So uh, those are those are the names that you should be prepared to uh, look out for, I guess, come come Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All right. Sweet. Christian, what do you think? Uh, I think it's going to be a great series, and uh, I would love to see an Ethan Bates on the mound, and maybe he can do something with his bat. Just It's just fun to see. I mean, obviously, I hope we – I hope they sweep them, but 
it would be fun to see how uh, Ethan Bates does this weekend and, and see how he kind of reunites with a couple of his old teammates and coaches. Um, but yeah, it's going to be fun. And, and back kind of back earlier, we were talking about what to expect from pitching. I think it's a good weekend for Zach Morris to get back in rhythm. He's, he hasn't pitched since March 1st, I believe. And they, they need him. They like with all these injuries and people, you know, not kind of performing how we thought they would. It's a big moment for him to step up. And then probably one of the freshmen is going to have to have a moment where they're like, okay, we can depend on you going forward after this weekend. So there's a lot on the line. It's a tough, it's going to be a tough matchup, but it should be, should be a good one. Yeah. No, I mean, Zach Morris, he, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, do you think that they, they, because it's like with Zach Morris, do you think that they're going to trust him in a close game? You know, like he, I don't think they can. I, I, it's tough. Like you mentioned it, Christian. Yes, you want to see Zach Morris, but it's got to be like a very specific situation for Morris to get in this weekend. I think. I mean, it's it's going to be tough. It's going to have to be low leverage. I think either way, you know, Arkansas gets up big or down big. Um, I, I think that's that's the only time you turn to Morris. I. You know, like I said earlier, like he's a veteran, you want to be able to trust him, but until he shows it, I don't know. I mean, he's I, given up he's given up more runs than anybody uh on this pitching staff. He's the only guy who's given up more than uh more than ten runs. He's given up ten earned, eleven runs total, fifteen hits, and that's all in just six and a third innings pitch. So it's tough. I, I think a good spot to put him in, regardless of what where the game is at, if if someone goes short like you know, four innings, four and a third, maybe let him get two outs or an out. And then maybe that's it just to see if he can see what he's got. I mean, even if it's like a closer game, but who knows? We'll see. I, I think a short, short outing makes sense, especially if, you know, it goes well, like let him, let him hang a zero and then, you know, have him, have him sit with that for, for, you know, until the next time he pitches, right. Enjoy, enjoy having a scoreless outing, no matter how, how short it is. I like that. I think that's a good idea. You know, we're not the coaches, but, uh, you know, if it's like a situational thing, you got a lefty coming up to the plate, uh, maybe throw Zach Morris in there, let him get an out or two. I like that. I think that's good. Of course, he actually has to get the out or two. That's the thing is like it, it, he has to he has to get the job done. But if he does, like you said, Robert, you know, uh, throw up a zero. That's good. That you know, get his confidence, let him get a couple outs, not give up a bunch of hits or runs, and then maybe he feels better. You know, there's that baseball is a baseball is a very uh mental sport. So if if he can get back mentally, you know, get that confidence back, because we've heard that his confidence is down, like straight from the mouth of players. So if he can get that confidence back, that would be huge for Zach Morris. It'd be huge for Arkansas. They need him. Uh, speaking of guys who have been huge for Arkansas, though, I mean, Jay Borfin and Jared Wagner, man, these dudes have been incredible to start the season. Jared Wagner's an All-American. Is, is that is that fair to say right now? Through, what, three? How many, how many weeks has it been? Three and a half weeks? Yeah. Uh, it, it's really looking that way. I mean, he's driven in more than 20 runs already, right? Uh, I have it pulled up. He's, uh... He has twenty two RBI. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. The home homer the other day pushed him over over that that mark. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's remarkable. And and how about I mean, raise your hand if you had Jace Borfin leading the team in the average right now. I didn't have him leading the team in average. It's it's nice to see like you know everybody always talks about that that injury where he ran into the wall and jammed his shoulder or whatever. It's nice to see that he's finally uh, gotten over that hedge and and shown everybody what he can really do because. Man, it's kind of long overdue. So I'm I'm looking at the the SEC stat leaders. Uh, Charlie Condone from Georgia, he's got 29 RBI, so that leads the conference. Uh, and then let's see, Ethan Groff from Missouri, he's got 24. Jack Caglianone, is that how you say it? I I don't know, but that dude's incredible. That dude. How many home runs does he have? Let me find his name again. Talk about an all-American. He has, he has 11 home runs already. We're three and then, weekends in. And then he'll go out there on Sunday and throw 97 on the mound. Yeah. Like, what? That is crazy. Um. Okay, so then 
That's we're looking at RBI. So he had what twenty five, and then you got you know a couple guys with twenty three, and then Wagner has the twenty two. So that yeah, he I mean he's having a great season to start. Uh, you know, I I did not expect him to. Yeah, I expected him to be good, but he's been incredible, and so that's good for Arkansas. I mean, we've talked a few times about. Well, I, I've mentioned it to you guys. I my comparison was uh Chris Lanzilli from last year, what he would be to this team, you know, just a, a power hitter in the middle of the lineup. And he's completely surpassed all my expectations and I think everyone's expectations. And I think he's better than Lanzilli. I mean, Lanzilli was the best hitter on the team last year, right? As far as average and home runs and like run producing. But I mean, Wagner has been unbelievable and I'm just so happy for him and happy it's been working out. So yeah, no, I I definitely think I mean it. There was a fair comparison. I think you're right in saying you know at least to this point, Wagner's definitely uh, producing more than Lanzilli did at this point last year, which Lanzilli really picked it up towards the second half of the season. I think, right, he did. Yeah, um, and you know, no, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just saying in, in Omaha too. Right. Um. I yeah. I was gonna say you know I I don't remember if I've mentioned this on on the pod before, but I think I think Jared Wagner read everything we wrote about Caleb Cali, right. We 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 gave uh we gave Cali a lot of hype based on what we saw in the fall. Wagner was just sort of, you know, it's not like he was doing badly at all. Like he was, he was just sort of he was just sort of there, consistent, uh, consistent on base guy, and and now he's just raking. I I think uh, I think he he wanted to he wanted to silence all the. Yeah, maybe we weren't doubters because we weren't actively doubting him, but we we weren't giving him the same hype that uh, that that Caleb Galley got. I think the thing with him is that he kind of flew under the radar, and I wrote this uh, on a few occasions. He committed to Arkansas while they were still playing; they were still playing in the postseason, and that's when he announced he was transferring to Arkansas. And so his name really flew under the radar, even through fall ball, right? We were talking a lot about other guys in fall ball. I mean, like Reese Robinette was the story of fall ball. Uh, And then, you know, that's – he just flew under the radar. And I I think that some of that has to do with when he committed. Some of it has to do with, you know, people didn't really uh, think much of him because they were like, all right, he's just going to be in the outfield, you know they were focusing on the the positions where there were battles like third base, shortstop, catcher, stuff like that, you know. He he did miss a good chunk of fall ball with uh, an oblique injury too. So that that may have that. something to do with it. Yeah. But uh also how about at the squatters club the other day Dave mentioned you know you 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 talked about how he committed while Arkansas was still playing in 2022. Dave mentioned like 3 weeks ago he learned that his name was pronounced Wagner. So yeah. No, no shame on the fans at all, or or the media for not knowing that when his head coach didn't even know it until I don't know had, how many months had, had they known each other at that point, like eight, yeah, at least something like that. And then we asked players like after the press conferences last week, uh, when did you learn that it was Wagner? And every single one of them, I think, said today. Hagen, like, Hagen in particular was like today. Yeah, and it's like what the heck. Like, why did he just not tell them, you know? I mean, it makes sense, though. Like, it's it, it's Wagner, you know? Like, that's that's what it should be. It's not my name, though, you know? Um, Christian, that's, hilarious. that's hilarious, though. Who who actually found out? Did, like, he finally admit it, or did someone ask him? I, I think it came up on, on Phil and Bubba's podcast, and then, uh, and then you know, it, it was the, the Illinois State game. He he walked – did he walk? No, that was that was Kendall Biggs. Um, but I, I think he – he was made available after the Illinois state game. And I was like, Jared, I have to know what's, what's going on with your last name, man. Yeah, no, it's crazy. That's that, that's been the storyline of like the past. Well, uh, aside from pitcher injuries, Jared Wagner has been the storyline of like the first three weekends. So Arkansas plays Louisiana tech this weekend, three game series starting Friday at 3 PM, Saturday at two Sunday at one, all of those central time, Reminder, Friday's game will not be televised, so go to hogabeat.com for all of the coverage that you need for that game. It will not be on television, uh, but Saturday and Sunday, those will be on SEC Network Plus, so you can stream those. Go to hogabeat.com. Tell your friends about the Diamond Hawks podcast. Thank you for listening to the Diamond Hawks podcast. 
You've been listening to the Diamond Hogs Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Chote Mason and at DRStew32.